Hi, everybody. It's uh, Brady Forrest here, and you can kick things off, Audra. We are about to have our second Ignite in place. I'm Brady Forrest. Back in 2006, my friend Bree and I decided to throw a geek event. Everybody got five minutes on stage, 20 slides, 15 seconds a slide, and that event is still taking place. It is one of the only events where the speakers really have no control, and so it always adds just a little bit of extra adrenaline. And we are bringing that online during these times of COVID. Uh, unfortunately, that slide just went through a little fast, but we have two causes that we are trying to support today. One is Paint the Void, which has been uh, painting and bringing life back to all the boarded up shops around San Francisco and in the Bay Area, and this is being copied around the country. And one of the founders is going to be on our uh, docket later. And then second is, I want to say that Ignite supports Black Lives Matter. And we are going to be, uh, we have made a donation to the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And we encourage you to donate to one of these groups in lieu of buying tickets. Uh, we do Ignite for free. This is a community event. And we hope that you can support one of these organizations. Now I'd like to welcome up our very first speaker of 12. She is an activist here in San Francisco and she is gonna share the safe way to get arrested while getting your cause furthered. Please welcome Hope Williams. Hey, Hope. Thanks for being here and Hi, take it away. This is me being arrested two years ago during a coordinated act of nonviolent civil disobedience. The cops use the ties, they usually do. And I've participated in four coordinated acts of nonviolent civil disobedience, and I've been arrested for three of them. The following is a remix of an MLK quote. First, I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white progressives. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the BLM's great stumbling block in their stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white progressive who is more devoted to order than to justice. Hi, my name is Hope and I train folks in San Francisco on how to commit coordinated acts of nonviolent civil disobedience. Um, there's a reason why we are familiar with the term civil disobedience. This photo is of the Greensboro sit-in, a civil rights protest that started in 1960. African American students staged a sit-in at a segregated lunch counter and refused to leave after being denied service. The sit-in movement soon spread to college towns and throughout the South. Pivot to now, the BLM was founded in 2013. Their mission is to eradicate white supremacy and build local power to intervene in violence inflicted on black communities by the state and vigilantes. And your mission, should you choose to accept it, appreciate the history of these types of actions, acknowledge your privilege, become inspired to use your privilege for good, and know how to organize an action safely and effectively. And remember, <laughs> leave your sassy mouth at home. This is not the time. If you are white, white passing a citizen, if you don't have a criminal record, and if you do not have serious medical needs and are not immune compromised, then you can participate. And these rules are a precaution, a criteria that I indoctrinate so as not to jeopardize anyone's life permanently. And I am privileged. And that might sound weird coming from a queer, black, Swiss, Swiss, <laughs> cis woman to say that I know that I am privileged. Beyond that, I know my rights. I know the system and how to control it. And I want to be able to share that with every single person who's ever been oppressed or wants to become a legitimate ally. I boiled it down to five steps uh, and how to get arrested. Remember to always have cohesion, be prepared and stay safe. The more prepared and the clearer your message, the more it will resonate with the outside looking in. Uh, Pick the people that you trust who will follow a plan and not make this about themselves. Also assign roles, jail support, citation gatherer, lead chanter, recorder, press liaison, legal representation. Always, 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 always choose people that you trust. Be specific. 
This is a screenshot of the video of me getting arrested four weeks ago. We were demanding that Mayor London Breed lift the curfew. Because personally, as a black woman, I didn't appreciate being told when I can protest. The curfew was lifted the next morning. Where will you do the action? Will you do it in front of the Mayor London Breed's house? I personally prefer in the major thoroughfare in San Francisco, in front of City Hall. Uh, and when should you, should you do it? Because timing is crucial, but mainly do not ever stop protesting. There should never be alone. And remember, if you train well enough, you will memorize and familiarize the entire process. Role play cop versus protester. Run through the part where the cops say, hi there, you're breaking the law, you're being arrested, will you resist? And people will always remember, say no. Execute. Trust your team. Trust the plan. Stay calm, stay safe, and get it done. And above all other rules, do not resist arrest. And also, do not take this opportunity to tell the cops what you really think about them. You will be putting the group and the movement in danger if you do. So remember, y'all, choose a group of people that you trust. Have a specific demand. Choose where and when. Train, train, and train some more. Follow the rules and think about why you're doing this and how your privilege allows you to participate in a coordinated act of nonviolent civil disobedience. Nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and foster such attention that a community who has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., letter from Birmingham Jail. Sustain this movement. The March on Selma, one of the most resilient and organized coordinated acts of nonviolent civil disobedience, began on March 7, 1965, where 600 civil rights marchers marched on Selma. They did this multiple times, and in less than a month, that number increased to over 25,000. Now, with the advent of social media, we can organize coordinated acts of nonviolent civil disobedience in a matter of days. These photos are from the last act that I did on Saturday. Uh, high school students organized, artists, union organizers, community leaders and myself to paint and to paint defund the police in, this, on, in front of City Hall. We need change. Uh, coordinated act of nonviolent civil disobedience is the most effective tool that we have. It's also the safest and um, we really got to utilize that if we want to see change come to fruition. And that's it. Five minutes on how to safely get arrested and organize a nonviolent coordinated act of civil disobedience. I really hope that this has inspired you to consider participating in this movement. If you have any questions, Please contact me. Um, thank you for having me and have a wonderful night. <laughs> thank you, Hope. It was when I saw that photo of you in your red shirt that uh, I reached out. So thanks for the work you're doing. Now, next up is a gentleman I've known for quite a while. He helped get wired off the ground and he is gonna take us on a journey in a time machine. Thank you very much, Kevin, for being here today. My pleasure. Take it away. I took this photograph of Srinagar, the capital of Kashmir and Himalayas, in the 1970s. Every single bit of that vast city is made by hand, including the brick, including the tiles on the roof, including the lumber, which was cut by hand from logs with two people and a saw. So every bit of matter had to be raised up by hand with human muscle or animal muscle. And that is how the old way worked a thousand years ago. This is the city of Kathmandu, uh, about a million people without a single vehicle, without even wheels. People had to walk everywhere. Wheels were present, but very expensive. And so you move things by your feet, including moving melons in Afghanistan with a barrow instead of a wheelbarrow because while wheels are present, they're expensive and roads were even more expensive. So if you had to move something valuable, you moved it by hand or by foot. If you were wealthy or sick, you had people move you because again, roads were expensive, people were cheap, and you moved by being carried in a pelican. That was the mode. Everything was animal or human muscle, including if you had to build something. These are workers in Sri Lanka moving heavy stones and they are barefoot because it was very expensive to have any kind of footwear. And even clothes were expensive, so they didn't wear them because they got worn down. If you wanted to thresh rice, like these Cambodian farmers, you used animal muscle and not just human muscle. So the world was limited by what you could do with human muscles before we invented artificial power. Even whole families would work together like this plaza in Kathmandu in Nepal, where the children who did not go to school were part of the workforce. You, they worked with their entire families, in this case, making pottery 
or drying herbs. And the infants were being carried on the backs of women as they worked, as they did field work, as they cooked, as they made pottery, they would have their youngest strapped to them in a very intimate bonding as they worked together. If you wanted to take a bath, you went to the communal bath because nobody had running water. And even cold water, running water was scarce. And so you came out into a public arena to bathe. If you wanted to have hot water bathing, you would have to heat it up, find a natural um, a hot springs, or pay a public bath for the privilege of hot water like they did here in Turkey, or they often do in um, Japan. The normal way was that you wanted to have a communal space. Churches, mosques, temples were not quiet, holy places. They were very noisy public places, and you might even sleep there. And kids would come and run around. It was a place that you gathered together. And chairs were expensive. They were present but expensive. They were for royalty. You reclined or sat on the floor. That was the normal way for anywhere in the world a thousand years ago. The most precious thing that you could have um, in the past was cloth. Cloth was the most tedious thing to make from scratch by hand. Here is a weaver in the Himalayas, and you had to make the thread first, and here are women in Tibet um, spinning wool. And so the very first thing that machine-made replacements replaced was cloth, because nobody really enjoyed making cloth from scratch. The world of the ancients was one of costume. I often remember the nuns growing up, and I wondered where their garb came from. It was preserved from what ordinary women wore in Europe 500 years ago. It was not really something weird. It was just normal things that was concerned. To move goods over a long distance, you had to use animals, and no animal would make the entire journey. The animals were offloaded at night in this caravan, like in Afghanistan, and then reloaded on new animals to the next leg the next day. So it was a very laborious process. Here is a market in uh, Afghanistan, and if you notice, there's no signs anywhere on any of the any of the stores because nobody could read. Literacy was very, very rare, and everybody knew where the local shops were. And the local shops were not something you walked into; they were something you walked up. And the proprietor sat in a ledge, and they handed you whatever it is that you asked for. And that's what a shop was, as this um, a Kashmiri thread stand is. This is a world that was only lit by the fire of the hearth, and it's a reminder that what we have today is truly, truly abundant in what we could live in. You don't want to live in the past like they did, as romantic as it may look. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, and once I learned about air conditioning and antibiotics, I'd never ever thought about, or dentistry, which I was taking advantage of last week. Never thought about living in the past. But thank you very much sure. for that. Take care. All right. And next up is Inga. Now, unfortunately, the slide that we were uh, trying to show with her project at the beginning kind of got skipped over. But she is one of the amazing women who have been painting uh, the, the boards all over San Francisco and basically bringing life to our city or back to our city. So. In lieu of tickets, if you are so inclined to support a nonprofit, I highly, highly recommend that you support Paint the Void or bring a similar uh, project or organization to your city. Inga, thank you very much for being here. Take it away. Thank you so much, Brady. This is a talk about the Gates of Paradise, which is the artwork that is considered to have ushered the Renaissance in Florence, Italy. Scholars, artists, and rulers alike all looked for guidance to the Roman Empire of the past to rebuild society and infuse public imagination with ideas of beauty, truth, and balance. This was a rebirth after the famines, plagues, and wars of the Middle Ages. The wealthy invested into artists to improve the quality of everybody's public lives. Half of Europe's population just got wiped out, just got wiped out by the Black Death. And consequently, there was a lot of political instability. Neighboring city-states were constantly at war with each other, and there were lots of shifts of power locally. There was a group, uh, there was a family of wool merchants that started giving loans to other merchants 
at these tables and piazzas called banchi. And for that reason, they became known as the world's first bankers. The church considered all, considered all this money lending to be usury and the increasingly wealthy merchants as a potential threat. So to appease the church, uh, they all started commissioning great works of art that propagated, uh, propagated biblical narratives. The Medici are certainly the most famous Florentines of all time, and they commissioned art for nearly 300 years. Lorenzo the Magnificent, as they called him, this guy here, was the most notable patron of the arts from that dynasty. But let's go back to the, to the gates. Uh, they were created by another Lorenzo, Gilberti, and it took him over 20 years to complete this commission. Once he was done, however, that's him right there, his little head, um, they made a huge splash. Depicted in the, pla in the plaque are 10 scenes of Genesis uh, that tell us an early story of humanity. These gold gilded doors were so awe-inspiring that it was proof that only God could have created such beauty. Another reason that these doors were so important was because of the breakthrough towards realism. The study of linear perspective and anatomy were brand new, use, brand new tools used by Renaissance artists. And art began to resemble the world. Plus Gilberti was the first visual artist to depict a narrative in three acts on the same picture plane. Here you, you see at the top, you have God gifting, uh, uh, birthing the earth, then Eve is born out of Adam's rib. Um, and then at the bottom, he uh, God exiles Adam. Um, you have to remember that the Byzantine art, uh, a picture here, that was right before the Renaissance, did not do so great in achieving realism. They played, they played around with linear perspective, but the scenes were generally quite flat, and humans looked more like mannequins. They made most important people look bigger. So here you have Virgin Mary looking bigger than the, than the angels. Um, so the doors of paradise were such a huge uh, breakthrough that they they really ushered in a new era of um, of art. Uh, they were so famous um, that there's never a time in Florence where there isn't a group of tourists just standing up there and gawking at these magnificent doors. What's interesting to me is Lorenzo de Medici's net worth was relatively small. It was only 1.5 billion, which is really not a lot compared to um, the billionaires that we have all around us in San Francisco these days. Here you have a little graph. So what the Medici did with the relatively small amount of net worth is create a legacy for their name that will never be forgotten in European history. They spent only $500 million on intellectual patronage, but they left the most beautiful city in their wake. Every single street of Florence is littered with beauty, history, and a heap of academic papers just waiting to happen. Luckily for us in the Bay, there's actually an exact replica of the Gates of Paradise um, in the center of our city at Grace Cathedral. It was created in 19 1956. Modern day San Francisco has a lot of similarities to Florentine uh, Renaissance. It's also a very wealthy city with great innovation. So hey, San Francisco, let's birth the Renaissance. My name is Inga Bard. The next slide is my contact info. And if you love fostering public art as much as I do, I'd really love to chat. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Inga. And uh, how many murals has Paint the Void done so far? Paint the Void has produced almost 100 murals, uh, starting with April 15, when we launched our first fundraiser. Thank you so much for everybody's support in the community. We really could not have done it without you. Let's keep this energy going for San Francisco. Yeah, thank you very much for being here. Take care. And now we are gonna journey to another set of uh, societies. Please welcome Connie Yang. Thank you for being here, Connie. Take it Thank away. You. So excited. Uh, 
I'm here to talk about matriarchies. There's a lot of things that are wrong with our society today from excessive violence and aggression to suppression of women's rights all over the world. I was curious to look at how matriarchal societies work to see what differences manifest in how people live. There's so few left, they're vanishing really rapidly, but hopefully we've got some good lessons. So a matriarchy uh, is different from a matriarch. Matriarchy is a society governed or controlled by women. A matriarch is either the ruler of a matriarchy or simply the oldest woman in a family. These can often be confused. Matriarchies themselves are actually very rare. Matrilineal means lineage, like property or uh, children are passed from the mother to daughter. And matrilocal means the husband actually moves into the wife's home or clan when, uh, when they get married. So that's also different from traditional what we have here. The first one that we'll cover is the uh, Moso clan in China. They're one of the best known matriarchies. Um, children are raised in the mother's household and they take her name. Um, the women handle all the business decisions. The most respected person in the household is the grandmother, as you can see here in this lovely uh, family photo. They have a great tradition known as the walking marriage, uh, which, oh, the slide appears to be not advancing, Brady. I don't know if that's... Uh, Okay, the, uh, the tradition of the walk, the walking marriage is where men visit uh, the, the rooms of, of women in the night and then go back to their own homes uh, and in the morning. So they don't actually live together. And it doesn't really matter who the father of the children are because the children belong to the mother and the children are raised in the mother's clan. And uh, the men actually take part in raising their nieces and nephews, but not so much their own genetic uh, children. And fun fact, there's no word for father or husband in that language because it does not exist. Um, in the, uh, the Akan people have a system of queen mothers who are considered to be the spiritual heads of the community. Um, women conduct many of the rites and ceremonies and they run things in, uh, in the food and domestic spheres. And oh, jumping to uh, this part of Kenya, we have a very different story. Women are not allowed to own land, property, or livestock, and women themselves are considered to be property of their husbands and subject to abuse, assault, and murder. Uh, Umoja means unity and was founded in 1990 by a group of women who are rape survivors, and they banded together to defend each other uh, against a man who had come to abuse them, and they uh, raise their children, learn, and govern themselves together. So an actual matriarchy, really fascinating. This is the last matriarchy of Europe, which is Mkinu Island, a tiny uh, island of 300 people in the Baltics. The men are mostly out in the sea uh, fishing, and so the women uh, are the cultural home. They, uh, they look after education, spirit, tradition. In Indonesia, we have the largest matrilineal society in the world, which is around 4 million. Uh, inheritance is passed from mother to daughter. The mother's ahead of the family and grooms are given away to the bride and he'll move into her awesome family home, which are these uh, traditionally uh, spiked buildings. So they are also uh, Muslim. And even though Islam is known uh, to favor men and boys, in this group, uh, the power and authority is actually more equally divided between men and women uh, with women ruling the, the domestic sphere and men, the political side. The Bribris in Costa Rica um, are really fascinating. The grandmothers are seen as the arbiters of tradition and knowledge. So only women are given the right and ritual to prepare the sacred cacao ceremony that's being, uh, that, that's used in many of their traditions. Men are not allowed to pass on that information. The Tuaregs in, uh, in the Sahara are, are nomadic people who hundreds of years ago, reading and writing were confined only to women with the men herding the livestock literacy represents power. So women had a very elevated status in society. They had sexual freedom and can have male visitors when their husbands are absent and they retain custody of the children after divorce. And in a flip, the men actually wear head scarves that cover their faces, not the women in this society. The Kasi in Northeast India, there's around 1 million of them. The uh, youngest daughter inherits and generally uh, the mothers and mother-in-law, mothers-in-law are the ones who raise, uh, raise the children. They do not have power in the uh, political sense, um, but the men have very little jurisdiction at home. My favorite tidbit is actually about their local language. Their word for tree is masculine, but when it's, when it's turned into wood, it becomes feminine. When something becomes useful, the gender of the word becomes female. And now for something different, we're gonna talk about bonobos. Bonobos and chimps are our closest relatives. Chimps live in a patriarchy, bonobos live in a matriarchy. Um, 
with chimps, you can see male dominance traits like rape, violence, and infanticide. And if you look at bonobos, you don't see any of those things. There's never been an observed case of rape and murder between bonobos in wild or captivity in this female dominant species. They actually um, are hypersexual, partake in every kind of sexual gender permutation, and they use this uh, hypersexuality as kind of a social glue and as a way to, uh, as an all-purpose problem-solving way to deal with conflict. Um, so what we can learn, women rarely ruled, but when Given the power of inheritance and custody of children, there were so many dramatic, wonderful changes. Uh, societies are more collaborative, more peaceful. And even though the last vestiges of these uh, matriarchies will disappear in a few decades, I hope we can keep the learnings with us and to learn uh, what happens when a society emp empowers women. Thanks. Connie, thank you for this aspirational talk. Uh, may, may the US someday reach, reach this level. Um, what, what are the two words? What's the what's the female word for wood? Uh, I do not know in that particular language what the word is, but maybe someone can tell me. I'm sure Wikipedia will. Thank you very much for being here. <laughs> Thanks, Brady. Take care. Uh, unfortunately, although we can hear about great societies around the world, our own is suffering quite a bit. And we are joined by an epidemiologist out of UNC to share some of the darker sides of some of the tragedies that are happening right now. Thank you very much, Maya, for being here. Take it away. So unless you've been living under a rock for the last couple of months, you've probably heard about the COVID-19, AKA coronavirus pandemic. I'm here to talk with you this evening about how the racial disparities we see in this disease were centuries in the making. Because you see, when we look at the last 400 years of American history, we can see that 86% of that time has been spent in periods of slavery or segregation, and only the last 14% of that time has been quote unquote free. And in the common media, you may have heard the popular refrain that black people are more likely to have adverse COVID outcomes because they're more likely to have pre-existing conditions like obesity. What's left out of the picture is how those pre-existing conditions like obesity became more prevalent uh, in black communities. Because after slavery, we had segregation that still endures in our metropolitan areas today. And this segregation has resulted in lower access to healthy food, poor healthcare access, and lower quality education for black Americans. And after segregation, we have mass incarceration in that free period, the systemic lockup of black and brown individuals because of the failed war on drugs and because of the confined spaces in incarcerated settings, it's a COVID-19 perfect storm. So where are we right now with the data? Uh, approximately 25,000 black people have died from COVID-19 to date. This is nearly one in 2,000 black Americans, making up around a quarter of the deaths where race is known. But these individuals who have died from COVID are more than just data points. They're active members of their community. Jana Prince was a case manager in New Orleans who was 43 when she died from COVID earlier this year. But we still don't know the full story because even though nearly all U.S. states and territories are reporting race data on their COVID cases and deaths now, this information is still missing for over 50% of reports. We have no idea how bad this actually is. But in places where we do have good race data, like Philadelphia, the situation is sobering, where we see that the youngest Black Americans, those between 20 and 34, have higher COVID incidence rates than the most at-risk white Americans, those above age 75. Why is this? In part, because Black Americans are more overrepresented in essential industries that have higher COVID exposure. These are nursing care facilities, residential care facilities, and transit services. And so all of these factors that have been reinforced by enduring legacies of segregation, employment, housing, neighborhood, and transportation have led to the perfect storm for why Black Americans are more at risk for contracting COVID-19. However, even when Black Americans do have healthcare access, they still have to contend with the medical racism that exists in our society. Complaints are taken less seriously, and the facilities that Black Americans have access to are often under-resourced to adequately treat this disease. The effects of COVID-19 span beyond just the medical for Black American. Though they are overrepresented in essential industries, Black Americans have acutely felt unemployment as a result of this pandemic. In addition, Black Americans are much more likely to be renters across the United States and have the potential to face mass evictions as a federal moratorium on evictions expires in a matter of a couple of weeks. 
And lastly, there's an untold effect on the youngest generation of Black Americans who have felt substantial educational disruptions as a result of this pandemic, particularly for those for whom access to online education is not accessible. And so where do we go from here? Looking forward, as talk of, of a COVID-19 vaccine heats up, we need to ensure the buy-in of Black Americans, because so far the United States has not proven trustworthy in protecting our health. In addition, Black Americans need to be involved at all stages of the process, from research to reopening policies. Nothing about us without us. No more entirely predictable pandemics. And lastly, we need to acknowledge racism for the public health crisis that it is at all levels. This includes local, state, federal, and even global. And finally, I'd be remiss to mention, if I didn't mention that the same forces that caused racial disparities in COVID-19, slavery, segregation, and mass incarceration are also the same forces that have caused police brutality in this country, another public health crisis affecting Black Americans. And yet, despite centuries of oppression, Black people are resilient people, pandemic, police brutality, and all, and still we rise. And if you're interested in epidemiology and racism hot takes on Twitter, you can find me at Maya L. Roberson. Maya, thank you very much for being here. Uh, we'll share out your some of your hot takes later. And, Thanks, uh, Brady. Thank you, Dr. Daniel Westreich, for connecting us. Thank you, Maya. Take care. And... Now we are moving on to Monica Guzman. So I met Monica back when she was the very first blogger at the Seattle, Seattle PI. And she recently just announced that she's going to have a book on reclaiming curiosity coming out soon. And I think as part of that, she's been having conversations. And that's what she's going to be talking about. And you can really view all of these Ignite Talks as a conversation with someone. Mm -hmm. So thank mm -hmm. you for being here, Monica. Take it away. All right. Like all of you, I am wrong about something. I'm actually wrong about a lot of things, and thanks to how divided our society is, I can't know what those things are unless I talk with people who are very different from me and ask myself the most important question we don't ask often enough. What am I missing? This question's tougher than ever today. Our world is changing so fast. There's no textbook for this. There's no experts to guide us through. All we really have is each other and the wisdom that we generate by living through extraordinary times in our own unique ways. But there's a catch. Fear, anxiety, the comfort we get from being in groups means we're all in these private echo chambers where it's easier to shrink our worlds than actually grow them. It feels nice to hear our beliefs affirmed back to us and it feels good to specialize instead of broaden, but I don't know that I'm really catching what I'm missing here. So I decided to look for a signal. How can I tell that a legitimately new insight is crossing that chasm between someone else's brain and my own? What do I look for? What do I chase? And I realized that that starts with a feeling. I'm learning something and then something clicks, a space opens up in my mind and I get this rush of energy. It's refreshing like someone opened a door in a stuffy room and now all I wanna do is see what's behind it. So I've decided that this has a name for me. It's I never thought of it that way. Into it for short, because those seven words are literally what I think or say. Whenever a thought crash lands on my brain, redraws my maps and makes me wanna be an explorer. My mission in life is to have as many of these into it moments as I possibly can. So I've gotten into the habit of capturing one every single day. Some are small, some are big, but all are profound for me because they're working on me. They're rewiring me slowly and it's fun to follow. These 13 people are responsible for one 15 day stretch of I never thought of it that way moments for me. Kim Jones uh, made a viral video comparing black oppression to a game of Monopoly that really stuck with me. The columnist Ross Douthat wrote about liberalism, a critique that has just stayed with me since I read it. But everyone else I've spoken with directly, one on Facebook and everyone else in conversation. Three of these conversations lasted longer than two hours. And the conversations with my rad Mexican immigrant parents who happened to have voted for Trump about race and policing went on for longer than six. Now, it's really hard for me to sum up the insights that I got from all these conversations here beyond these little labels, because anytime that we package ideas for public consumption, we tend to smooth 
the edges out, even though the edges are really everything. When we talk to someone else while really playing to the crowd, we don't take risks. So we don't build traction, the trust that comes from being honest and perfect humans trying to figure something out. We're too busy being polished to be real. Leave the edges in though, and people speak freely. He feels judged, she wonders if she said too much, but they keep climbing. The times we misunderstand and misexpress, but keep going, make the difference. They're what let us calibrate our way to I never thought of that way moments in the first place. So how do you do that? Well, first you resist the stage. When you have chats on Twitter, Facebook, any place that someone can lurk, you will edit yourself away from your genuine curiosity and toward conformity with whatever team you wanna be on. There's value there, but we have to be careful. You ever wondered why road trip movies are always about self-discovery? It's because people are stuck together with nothing else to do but share what's actually floating through their minds. Whenever you share space and time with someone, that's a really great opportunity to lean in and ask questions. What do you ask? Whatever it takes to stay on stories and get the other person to tell stories. Stories are what help us relate. Um, and instead of getting to opinions and then debating them, ask people how they came to believe what they believed. Ask them to share their path and the actual experiences in their lives that got there. And then do that for yourself. And as you both start sharing stories, they become stepping stones to I never thought of it that way moments. And it's really pretty, pretty fun. Because look, um, really at the end of the day, what we're missing is each other. Um, Everything in our lives is pushing us to just be around people who already see things the way we do. There's nothing pushing us to do the opposite, so we're gonna have to push ourselves. We think better together this way, I'm convinced of that. And as far as I'm concerned, these 13 people who gave me my I never thought of it that way moments, and everyone who's given them, gonna give them to me in the future are giving me a gift of their time and their perspective, and I only hope I can give that back. These quick tips are just the beginning. What was your I never thought of it that way moment today? What will it be tomorrow? And if you start paying attention, what are the patterns you can start to watch for and learn about how you can keep your world from shrinking and make it grow, even in crazy divided times? So join me. I'm organizing some fun experiments to keep asking questions, uh, even when things are so wild. And if you're curious, we need you. Um, go to bit.ly slash reclaim curiosity to sign up, reach out, and learn more about the book I'm writing about all this madness. All right, folks, stay curious and thanks. Thank you, Monica. Have a great night. And I can't wait for the book. Cheers. All right. We are in the like back half of the Ignite, and we're about to embark on a mini arc of substances, a history of them, uses of them, and perspectives on them. Please welcome first Jeremy Conrad to talk about the hometown San Francisco favorite of cocktails. Take it away, <laughs> sir. Happy to be here. Thanks. So I'm here today to talk to you with a very brief history of cocktails. And really cocktails are something that's drunk in every, nearly every country in the world on all seven continents, but really how did they get started? Well, I think we've got to go back in time even further to the BC before cocktails. And what you really had were punches. So in the revolutionary kind of war era part of the United States, you'd walk into a tavern and you'd ask for a drink and they'd ladle you out whatever they had. And so you actually got a very interesting punch culture based on what was available peaches, sugar, honey. And so really kind of as it evolved and as America got richer, they were finally able to make these single cup punches. And so it kind of happened everywhere in this kind of convergent evolution. So, you know, sometimes people talk about how, you know, Americans kind of were, it's hard to think about in the past. And really cocktails were the first great American innovation. It was actually our first global export in terms of culture. And actually, even as early as the 1820s, people were writing about when they came to America, one of the things that was so amazing was the cocktails. Now, people kind of, NOLA in particular, likes to claim that they're the birthplace of it, but it's really a bunch of different parts of America kind of invented it at the same time. So in 1806 was the first ever real explanation in print of what a cocktail was, and it's pretty boring. But this guy, in a letter to the editor, really doubled down. He was an avowed Federalist, and he really hated the Democrats at the time. And he goes further talking about the use of cocktails and what kind of a kind of bad, kind of awful drink that they were. And he said, it is said to be of great use to the Democratic candidate because once a person having swallowed a glass of it is ready to swallow anything else. This guy was so slanderous. He was sued by Jefferson and defended by none other than Alexander Hamilton. But really kind of at the time, why do we have ice in our cocktails? Why are they always cold? 
Well, we can owe this to one great man in 1806 deciding to become the Ice King of Boston. Now, this guy, he decided that ice should be transported everywhere in the world because to have warm cocktails was awful. So he actually started to kind of harvest ice and he figured out how to ship them and store them in kind of ice houses all over the globe. And what's interesting is he had, his name was Frederick Tudor and his business model is he would go to these bars, maybe in Havana, maybe in New York, maybe in Boston itself and give them the ice for free and then only charge them for refills. He was wildly successful. He died a millionaire and he was kind of insatiable in terms of his ability to kind of find new markets and grow this. So he actually would send people out to harvest this. And the craziest story I found was that in 1833, before refrigeration, when the journey was still four months, he managed to deliver a hundred tons of, of ice all the way to India. They actually kind of thought it was a practical joke when they heard the ship was coming filled with ice in the middle of the summer, and they all showed up to the ports and the ship opens up and crate after crate after crate of ice was there. So the other thing is that he did this all over New England. He even managed to harvest Walden Pond while Thoreau was there trying to figure out what came next. He actually complains about all these Irishmen showing up and harvesting his precious lake. And then in terms of bartenders who really kind of made it what it is today, we have Professor Jerry Thomas. Now he wasn't the first bartender or even the first celebrity one, but he's probably the most prominent in the 1800s. Now, as many people, he started off as a failed gold miner. So he got to San Francisco on a ship, fled the ship as many did, went to the hills, and eventually figured out, as many people, to sell picks or drinks in this case to the gold miners themselves. So he had a little bit of a cocktail background, but he set up at the Hotel Occidental. It actually burned down in the 1906 earthquake, unfortunately, but he was legendary and his fame only grew. But not only was he a great bartender, he actually learned how to invent various drinks. So he's actually credited with the Martinez, which becomes the Martini. He made it for someone who'd struck it rich, who was about to get on the ferry from San Francisco to go back to Martinez in the North Bay. And so named the drink after him. And really kind of, he was this really over the top bartender. He had this famous signature flaming drink that he made. He wore gold, he wore diamonds. He moved back to New York. He opened this bar there. It was like incredibly popular. But the reason that he kind of became the iconic bartender of 1800s is he wrote the first ever cocktail book in 1862. Kind of falsely took credit for some cocktails inventing as well. But the reality is this was kind of the tone that went around the world that when people made cocktails, this is what they reference back to. You can actually still get copies, see copies in libraries in New York today. So that's a little bit about cocktails. Here's some more resources if you're interested. And I'm just Nomadic Nerd on Twitter, so come find me anytime. All right, thank you very much, Jeremy. And what, are you, what cocktail are you having tonight? Uh, well, I will post on Twitter after this, so you will find All right. out there. Cheers. Take care. Cheers. Everybody. Now, Chris is going to be talking about a substance that is often thought of as recreational, and he has a different perspective on it. Thank you very much for being here, Chris. Thanks for inviting me, Brady. All right, so this is a talk about microdosing, uh, what it is, how you do it, and why you might be interested in doing it. Maybe you've heard that microdosing helps with PTSD, anxiety, depression, uh, that it even can help conquer addiction, but you're unsure about what it actually involves. Uh, now, let's first of all give you some caveats. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a researcher, I'm a journalist. If you really want to dig into this topic, go to MAPS. Uh, or go to Arrowwit. There's uh, plenty of information on those websites. Um, what we're going to talk about today is not cannabis microdosing. Um, we're going to talk about microdosing psychedelics in particular, uh, which there's a lot of research, much of it driven by this guy, James Fadiman, who worked out a protocol for how you should microdose. And it was replicated in this book by I.L. Waldman uh, called A Really Good Day, How Microdosing Made a Mega Difference in My Mood, Marriage, and Life. Uh, that's what Ayala told me, that it basically replaced an alphabet soup of uh, pharmaceuticals that she was taking. I wrote a review of this book, and that gave me the idea that I should probably attempt to microdose myself. So uh, the rest of this talk is about my personal experience of doing that, and uh, I encourage you to uh, dig into that, uh, dig into the review, or dig it into uh, Ayala's book. Now, let's talk about this drug that I'm going to talk about called Alice. 
which I, I had uh, experience with in, in past times of full doses uh, about a decade before I began to microdose. So this is an entirely different way of experiencing it. Uh, you are literally taking just one tenth of a regular dose. Uh, so in here, in theory, th this is how I might have done it. In theory, this is how you might do it if you're interested. First of all, take a, about 150 milliliters of water. Uh, you can also use uh, vodka or similar clear alcohols, but you probably don't want to do that since you're going to be taking this first thing in the morning. So you take that 150 milliliter dose, you put it in a bottle, uh, like a swell bottle or something you can stick in the fridge that is opaque. Uh, you put your, your tab of Alice in there and uh, you, uh, you shake it up, you leave it in the fridge for two days, and then after two days, you take one tenth of a dose. So whatever you put in, if you put in 100 milliliters, take 10 milliliters. If you put in 150, like I do, take 15. But take it in the morning, because uh, it can feel, it can sort of lift you up a little bit. Uh, but in general, it's supposed to be sub-perceptual. Most important thing is that you keep a journal. You must keep a record of how you are feeling. You can then send it into researchers like James Fadiman who collect these journals. Uh, but you've got to see how you feel day to day and, and make a note of that. Here's how it works. Day one, you microdose. You take that 15 milliliter dose. It should be sub-perceptual. Uh, you, you may perhaps notice you're paying more attention to things. That's okay. It shouldn't feel like a full dose of psychedelics. Uh, day two is transition day. Uh, that is what a lot of people report, including Ayala in her book, uh, is where the good stuff happens. This is where you feel mellow and calm and your anxiety is gone and you're ready to take on the world, take on projects. Day three is normal day. That means the the substance is out of your brain, basically, and you're back to normal reality. So you've got to build that in to uh, experience what normal reality is versus microdosing reality. And then day four, you go back to the microdose and wash, rinse, repeat. Um, so here's what we learned over the last three years. I started doing this in about April 2017. And first of all, there, there's been a lot of research that has come out since then. Uh, researchers are really starting to pay attention to psychedelics. Uh, you probably haven't seen this one, but it shows that uh, psychedelics, especially when microdosed, uh, can promote uh, the brain's ability to change, learn, grow, and form new connections. In other words, it can make you smarter. So the notable results in my case is that I started meditating more. I'd had an interest in meditation. I started doing it more, which had its own cascading health benefits. So it's hard to say, you know, what which were they the result of? Um, and uh, I just felt general in better and uh, was having fewer arguments. This is what Michael Pollan says about psychedelics. They are anti-addictive. They not only help conquer addiction, they're anti-addictive. I found that and, and built more normal days into my protocol because they basically forget to take the dose. Uh, this is a story I wrote after my experience with psychodosing. The future is getting smart, smarter, microdosing. Uh, and uh, Ayala told me for that that maybe in five years we will have prescription psychedelics, a uh, microdose version of course. And I look forward to that day and for what it can do for everyone who needs it. Thank you very much. Chris, thank you very much for uh, sharing this. And you were at the beginning of this when you did your first Ignite talk on stage, right? <laughs> yes, I, I was at the beginning of the ex experience and accidentally had taken two doses that day. So that's why I tell you, just take the one dose. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Take care. And next up is Cecily Mack. She's joining us from north of San Francisco, and she wants to make us at least help us question our views on a certain substance. Take it away. Thank you. You know that little voice inside of you? It's often called our intuition, our gut, and inner knowing. It's often audible when we're alone in nature or in those first few moments of the day. For a long time, that inner voice was asking me, would my life be better without alcohol? It haunted me a little bit, but I kept living my life as normal of no particular significance. After all, I was a social drinker. I drank wine with dinner, cocktails after work, beers on the beach. And as far as I could tell, my drinking habits were normal. I was surrounded by people who behaved the same way. And though I had no incidents, I had no DUI, I never put my children in jeopardy, I never had any rock bottom moment of any kind. I had this haunting hunch 
that maybe my life would be better without it. Then in September of 2017, some significant events put my life into a tailspin. And I was faced with a myriad of very, very significant decisions that would impact my life, that of my family, my community, my finances, and beyond. And I knew that I had a number of communications ahead of me that I wanted to be making from a very clear place. No regrettable kisses, texts, emails, or conversations. So I took a break. I took 30 days off just to get clear, make sure I was navigating from the right place. And the, the differences, the changes were pretty profound. I looked different, my skin cleared up, my eyes were really white. I was standing taller and I lost a little weight. I also felt different. My energy was high, things felt great. And there were some profound differences as well. I felt like my priorities got really clear, my career lit up, my creativity lit up, and I was able to forgive some people, which freed me. Yet, as I started telling people in my life about this awesome change and how happy I was to be freed from this habit, I had two consistent responses. My drinking friends said, oh, I didn't know you had a problem. And my non-drinking friends warned me to not tell people because they would think I was weird. So this sparked a lot of research. There, it turns out there are a lot of books out there on this topic and podcasts. I even went to a handful of AA meetings, talked to professionals, trying to educate myself on this topic. Why was it so loaded? Well, it turns out it's been a loaded topic for a long time. Even in the United States, it was just 100 years ago that through the 18th Amendment to the Constitution, we had a period of prohibition, which, as these flyers show, was largely driven by social and medical issues. The big alcohol industry, named so because it embodies a lot of the tendencies and uses a lot of the tactics of big tobacco, is massive. It's a $1.5 trillion global industry and growing. And they have some messages on the topic too. In fact, through the billions of dollars that have been spent on lobbying and advertising, there seems to be two types of people. People who don't drink because they can't, those are the alcoholics, and everybody else who should and could drink responsibly. There's also a lot of warning out there about the health concerns of consuming alcohol. In fact, earlier this month, the American Cancer Society revised its guidance on drinking from moderation one or two drinks a day to abstinence altogether. So was I an alcoholic? This perplexed me. And I went and sought some professional guidance. I wanted to understand and I concluded that probably not. I had some unhealthy habits and I probably self-medicated through some tough stuff. But my headline and my conclusion is that I wasn't an alcoholic and I didn't want to drink responsibly. I'm just in this third emerging category of people who choose to not drink because life is better for us without. So we are in one of the most transformative times in human history. Things are changing at a meta and a micro level every single day. We are individually and collectively making some of the biggest decisions of our lives that will impact ourselves, our families, our communities and beyond on our health, our livelihood, education for our kids, home politics and justice. Yet alcohol consumption is up significantly. In fact, year over year, Americans are consuming 55% more alcohol than they were this time, 2019. So we're not really navigating from a clear place. I suggest that we take a look at that. Are we doing our best? Are we approaching these moments from a place that resonates with us, our own clear place? So I invite you to ask, what is your little voice trying to tell you? Thank you. Thank you, Cecily, and thank you for just putting together a delicate topic so well and for opening up to all of us. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. But now we're going to learn about fancy pigeons. Please welcome uh, Ignite and Lucasfilm and, uh, and uh, Odd Salons, one of our, all of our favorite historians, Kelly Jensen, to share of times past and trends that have changed. Take it away, Kelly, thank you. Thanks, Brady. So I'm Kelly Jensen, and I'm gonna talk about fancy pigeons for a second, uh, just cause they're weird and I want you to know about them. Uh, this talk has no redeeming social value whatsoever, uh, but since pigeons are probably the only wildlife you're seeing these days, you know, 
it might help if you hated them less. So you may or may not know that there is this whole subculture of people breeding fancy pigeons uh, in all shapes and sizes, and it's kind of like best in show, but with pigeons. Uh, so like dogs, pigeons are all one species, but with almost infinite variability within that species. So, uh, so every pigeon that I'm gonna show you tonight is basically the same as the flying rat feral versions that you see on the street every day. Uh, Charles Darwin's book, The Origin of the Species, the whole first chapter is about pigeons because of their variability. And Darwin's editor hated the book, hated it, uh, and suggested that Darwin wrote an entire book about pigeons instead because, quote, everyone's interested in pigeons. So Darwin kept pigeons himself. Uh, he got them uh, when he was doing his research on evolution, but he fell in love with them so much that he thought that showing them to visitors was, quote, the greatest treat that can be offered to a human being. So there's three basic types of purebred pigeons. There are the eating pigeons or squabs, very meaty, very delicious. There are the homing or racing pigeons, uh, very fast flyers, good at finding their way home. And there are the weird pigeons, which is what we're gonna talk about, uh, like this muff tumbler who has an outstanding pair of boots. So there are pigeon fanciers who devote their whole lives to developing nice boots for muff tumblers. Uh, there are also powder pigeons that uh, can inflate their chests like balloons. And when you have a pair of them, they'll spend so much time showing off their sexy balloon chests to each other that they will forget to take care of their chicks. So if you raise that breed, you have to use foster parents. Uh, there are also Jacobins who have these fancy feathers uh, around their necks that make them look like they're wearing fancy fur coats. And to be clear, Jacobins are born like this. This is not the result of pigeon groomers with tiny hair dryers and combs uh, brushing out the pigeon feathers. Uh, barbs and English carrier pigeons have this extra skin around their beaks that makes them, um, oh my God, I forgot the technical term. Um, disgusting, fucking disgusting. That is the technical term for the extra skin around the face. So fantails have so many extra tail feathers that they had to develop extra large chests to balance the weight out. And that meant that their heads moved onto their backs and I just, I don't even know what to tell you about this mess. It's, it's messy. Uh, there's a breed called the parlor roller that forgets how to fly when it's about four months old. But if you chuck them along the ground like a bowling ball, they will do continuous somersaults, like up to 700 feet in some cases. So pigeon fancying is a weird hobby in the US because it's kind of sharply divided between white rural folks on the one hand and urban black and brown folks on the other. So it's a little uncomfortable. Uh, but there are these grand national pigeon shows that you could go to uh, if you wanted to see this in person. But like all pets, there are unwanted fancy pigeons. So this is a page from Pet Finder with rescue pigeons that you could adopt. And they will apparently sit on your shoulder and they're very sweet. You cannot train them to use a litter box, which brings us to pigeon pants. Uh, fortunately, Etsy has you covered in the pigeon diaper department. Uh, my favorite quote about this is, Pigeons prefer to be naked, but they're good sports about wearing pigeon pants. So there's that. So how come we hate pigeons so much now? We used to love them. Like they are all over the world because we brought them with us. Uh, we had them as message carriers. We had them as meat. They were our first domesticated bird before chickens and geese. So basically what happened was after World War II, we were able to create this big food surplus and they started eating our leftovers and then their populations exploded and now they are everywhere crapping on everything, which is revolting. But here are a couple of facts that might make you hate pigeons less the next time you see them on the street. One, they can sense the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, two, they can see in ultraviolet, which includes two different colors that we can't even imagine. And they can fly for 110 miles per hour for hours and hours on end. Uh, over 30 pigeons have been decorated as war heroes for carrying messages through enemy lines. And people have even attached uh, tiny cameras to them so that they are able to take aerial photos from the sky. So hopefully that takes the edge off pigeons a little bit. Uh, if you wanna go further down this rabbit hole, here are some books, uh, Unseen Cities by my brother, shameless plug, it's very good. And thanks for letting me ramble about pigeons for five minutes. Thank you very much for uh, being here today, Kelly, and uh, take care. Thanks, Brady.
All right. And Robert Strong has been with us many times. He is a well-known magician. He does a great show, both virtually and live. And that's so what do you great. got for us? Follow, follow uh, Kelly Jensen, the pigeon lady. She left out the uh, one pigeon. It's the uh, magic pigeon. <laughs> Thank you very much, Robert. Take it away. Sure. My name is Robert Strong, and I'm a comedy magician. And today I'm going to teach you how to do a magic trick while teaching you how the brain is fooled. Uh, there are optical illusions. There are visual illusions. And what most magicians do is something called a cognitive illusion. A cognitive an, an optical illusion or a visual illusion tricks how your, your eye and your brain connect and see the world. But a cognitive illusion is actually, uh, we make a better memory. We trick the memory. So if you're to watch a video of it in slow motion and watch it again, the trick would not fool you. So today, ladies and gentlemen, the trick I'm going to teach you is the vanishing playing card. So watch the playing card very closely. And of course, it's lined up. And just like that, the card vanishes and the card reappears. So that's the vanishing playing card and the reappearing playing card. So I'm gonna invite everyone to get a deck of cards, specifically a playing card. You can use an index card or even a uh, business card, a credit card in a bind. So the reason this works is based on assumptions. Magicians understand the assumptions you make. There's interference, that's called misdirection. And specifically on this one is limitations. What does it mean by limitations? I'll explain. The secret is that there is a small motion. The small motion is like this but the brain can't perceive that because it's hidden by a larger motion and the larger motion and the smaller motion combined together gives you the illusion that the card vanishes. So I'm gonna invite everyone to go over and meet me at camera number two and I'm going to teach you how to make a playing card in slow motion. Excellent, over here at camera two. Excellent, so ladies and gentlemen, take your playing card and give it a little bit of a bend or a bow and uh, it's gonna be concave from the point of view of the back of the card and what you're going to do is you're going to place in your hand, you're going to hold it between your index finger and your pinky, and it's not going to be inboard, it's going to be outboard or outbound towards the smaller knuckle. And what you're going to do is you're going to bring your index finger and your middle finger in so that you can see the fingernails just like in that image. And I use these images is because this is how I learned it as a 12-year-old 35 years ago. And what you're going to do is you're going to open your hand flat and pivot the card so that it goes behind the hand. You've got to be careful of the angles because if they see too much on this side, uh, they won't be tricked or too much on the other side. They won't be tricked also So the card is hiding behind the hand and the back of the hand looks something like this A lot of people are concerned about the little corners or tips that kind of poke through You don't have to worry about that because no one's actually expecting that So now that you have mastered the back palm What you're gonna do is you're gonna make the card appear So everybody start in the back palm position Which is often a lot easier to start here and it's clamped between your pinky and your index finger and your hand is flat facing the audience what you're going to do from the top point of view is you're going to make a fist like so, and you're going to place your thumb on the face of the card. So we go back to back palm position, come into a fist, thumb on the card, open your fingers up, and it looks like you're plucking it from an apple tree. From the audience point of view, if I go flat like this, I have the big motion. If I don't do the big motion, it comes in like this and the card disappears. So the card vanishes and appears and is hidden by the big motion like that, and same for making it reappear. So to review everyone, take a playing card, place it between your index finger and your pinky, bring your middle finger and your ring finger together so you can see it, rotate it back, that's the vanish, and bring it forward to appear. Now do magicians stop there? Oh no, they take everything a step further. So now I'm gonna show you something that's called a front palm. And then we're gonna take it to the advanced level, which is the front palm to back palm. So everybody uh, take the playing card from this position, just like in the drawing, and bring it into front palm position, just like this. And from the back point of view, it looks like it vanishes. But how do you get there? You push it against the heel of your thumb and you rotate it back. Now, if you can do it under the, the concealment of a little bit of a wrist motion, it looks something like this. Here's the back of the hand, it's in front palm, and into uh, back palm. So front palm to back palm, back over. You're seeing a little bit of a flash because I'm trying to get the camera angle just right to uh, back palm. So magicians take it a step further also. Once you've mastered the front palm to back palm, you can actually grab a bunch of deck of cards and uh, a bunch of cards. And I know some magicians can even make a whole deck of ca uh, cards disappear. So everybody, let's go ahead and start in the back palm position, give the cards a little bit of a bend. And what I'm gonna attempt to do is I'm gonna make the cards up here one at a time. So from the top point of view, you get to see kind of uh, the behind the scenes point of view. So I bring it forward and I make a card up here, a card up here, a card up here, a card up here. And from the audience point of view, that looks very much just like real magic. So let's talk about the uh, practice. The only way to do this is if you practice, practice, practice. And I mean, when you're in line, when you're at the airport, when you're on a plane, on a bus, always, always practice. Every opportunity you get, you should practice. Also, if you wanna get really good at card magic, there are three books that you must have. 
the royal road to card magic, the expert card technique, and the expert at the card table. So now, ladies and gentlemen, once you study magic, what is the challenge? The challenge is after you teach somebody how to make a card disappear with a big motion cover, small motion, can you still make the card disappear when they know the method? Watch closely. I don't even have sleeves. And just like that, ladies and gentlemen, slowly the card has vanished. So always take it to a new level. I hope you all enjoyed. My name is Robert Strong. I thoroughly enjoyed entertaining all of you. Thanks for your time. Robert, thanks for uh, bringing some magic to Ignite. And uh, take care. All right. And our last speaker was featured in Monica's deck. Melina White was one of Monica's conversations. So thanks for uh, bringing us home and giving a new perspective to both Monica and us. Take it away, Melina. Thanks for having me. Thank you. In my experience with these types of conversations, I believe there should be a certain level of planning and a clear and communicated goal. Those were the words of a white ally correcting me on how to approach conversations about race. And in that moment, I felt drowned out by the white voices volunteering to help facilitate uncomfortable conversations surrounding the deaths of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and the countless other black people who they would never even hear about. You know the voices I'm talking about. They share countless memes, videos, and posts about race to their social pages, instructions on how we should educate ourselves, or images that just simply say, Black Lives Matter. They recommend books written by elite white academics, go to weekend anti-racism classes that are also taught by well-respected and white professors. They feel that their education about racism is more valuable than the actual experience of the black people who feel it every single day. And even though they mean well and have the best of intentions, I've realized that many white progressives view people like me as marginalized, weak, and in need of protection simply because of my race. But in my view, they've got it all wrong. In fact, if we were going to just generalize black people in such a broad sense, I would argue that African Americans are the most resilient group in America. I mean, how could we not be after enduring hundreds of years of slavery, then Jim Crow, and now mass incarceration? And if you don't believe me, have a conversation with a Southern black auntie. She'll set you straight. Now, I'm a data person, so I understand that research shows that incidents like those that we've seen across our country lately are extremely rare, it's true. However, that is not the reason for the protests, the anger, and really the exhaustion. I know this because I live it every single day of my life, casual racism. On numerous occasions, I have personally been called a fucking faggot, a dyke, the N-word, half-breed, zebra, I've gone to a fancy clothing store and had the employee ask me if I was shopping for a court date. I've gone to a car dealership only to be denied a test drive. My encounters with casual racism are regular. Modern day racism has the face of COVID-19. It is silent and invisible, yet deadly. It's taxing on some communities while almost non-existent in others. And if it doesn't impact your family, you might even suggest that it's a hoax. But racism is very real. And if you perceive yourself as an authority on anti-racism because of a book, meme, or documentary, I have a question for you. Do you have any real life black friends? Seriously, do you? And I ask this because I believe that taking action is not sharing the same posts that everyone else in your echo chamber is sharing. It means getting out of your comfort zone and meeting people in real life. It means listening with an open mind to people of color. It means embracing your discomfort. And it all starts with a very simple idea, friendship. Now you might be wondering, how do I make friends with people of color? Well, I've got some ideas for you. So first off, show up to community, community events happening in the more diverse neighborhoods of your city. In Seattle, we have what's called Africatown in Columbia City, where a lot of the Black Lives movement has been spearheaded. Or how about a chance to interact with every single minority in a single night? Well, seek out alternative dance parties like queer POC nights. 
In Seattle, we've got Slay, and it is guaranteed fun. Or you could just think about how you got all of those white friends you have and then do the same thing to find POC friends. We're just humans too. And if you're a little scared about maybe being the only white person in the room, don't worry. What will happen is you will stand out, more people will talk to you, and you'll make even more friends. And if all else fails, you can talk to this guy, me. I will go out with anyone for free pricey cocktails. So just send me an email and we'll hang out. But in all seriousness, while all of these actions that I've suggested seem tiny, they deliver huge results. So get off your computer, put down that book, and if it's safe, leave your house. Meet real human beings. You might not be able to change the law, but you can make that single action yourself. So as your community begins to reopen, use this moment to expand your, your circle. Because real societal change starts with human beings connecting and treating each other as individuals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melina. I will hope to meet you someday in person in Seattle. Take care. All right, thank you. And that concludes our second Ignite Live. Uh, we'll be back later this month and we'll be putting out a call for speakers soon. Take care and be safe.